So, Boker Tov, everyone. We are now beginning the fourth book of the Chumash, of the Torah of Moshe, known as Bemidbar. Uh, people often translate it as Numbers. Uh, that is not a translation. The reason the book in English is called Numbers is because the beginning of the Parsha talks about a census, the counting of the people, i.e. taking their number. Um, but the first significant word that you see here in this verse um, is Vayadaber Hashem, El Moshe, and God spoke to Moshe, Bemidbar, in the wilderness. Others translate it as desert, but it, it, they weren't in a desert for 40 years. They, even with God's help, that I don't know how they would have done that. But they were in the wilderness. There were no settled communities. There were no towns. They were setting up small encampments for a few years here, a few years there. And it's also not, um, it's not random. It's not coincidence that the book of Bamidbar, this particular parasha, comes on the Shabbat right before Shavuot. It always happens. And Bamidbar also talks about um, the experience of God talking to Moshe and specifically a shift. Before this, in the last book of the Torah, the way that Moshe, that God had spoke to Moshe was on Har Sinai, away from the people through flame, through fire. But finally, now we have a Mishkan. We have a structure that we can touch, we can see, we can smell, we can interact with. And there's a tent where Moshe goes inside of the Ohel Moed, which also is in this, um, uh, in this first, uh, this first pasuk, and this is a different way that we are now communicating, or Moshe is communicating with God. And Shavuot is the holiday when we celebrate the giving of the Torah. But the moment when the Torah became real for us is not really the the fire and the lightning on the top of Mount Sinai. It's when the Torah was in our hands. We could start learning it and interacting with it. And just on this first verse of Midbar alone there are countless commentaries, and we're going to look at some of the most famous ones about understanding a key moment here, which is why was it important that when Moshe, or when God started speaking to Moshe here, that it was specifically in the wilderness? Why couldn't he have just said it was in the tent? Why couldn't God have just said that God just spoke to Moshe? Why do we care that it was out in the wild? And what does that have to do with our relationship with the Torah, which we celebrate on Shavuot? How should we think about the Torah? How should we interact with it? And we'll see that different rabbis um, find different ways to interpret that word b'midbar. And again, I think it's also very inspiring as we are going into Shavuot starting this coming weekend. So I'll just take this, this first verse and then um, uh, Gloria, you'll take the first uh, midrash. So, on the first day of the second month, in the second year following the Exodus, the going out of Egypt, the Lord spoke to Moshe, Moshe, in the wilderness of Sinai, in the Ohel Moed, this tent of meeting. And now the rabbis are going to take that one word, midbar, wilderness, and just have a field day with it. Aha, no pun intended, field day. So Gloria, if you will take um, this Midrash, Bamidbar Rabbah, uh, and this is one of the, the most classic understandings, uh, famous and classic understandings of why the Torah was really connected to our people in the wilderness. So please, Gloria. And God spoke to Moses in the Sinai wilderness. Why the Sinai wilderness? From here, the sages taught that the Torah was given through three things, fire, water, and wilderness. How do we know it was given through fire? From Exodus 19:18, And Mount Sinai was all in smoke as God had come down upon it in fire. How do we know it was given through water? As it says in Judges 5, 4, the heavens dripped and the clouds dripped water at Sinai. How do we know it was given through wilderness, as it says above? And God spoke to Moses in the Sinai wilderness. And why was the Torah given through these three things? Just as fire, water, and wilderness are free to all the inhabitants of the world, so too are the words of Torah free to them. As it says in Isaiah 55, 1, Oh, all who are thirsty come for water even if you have no money. Another explanation, and God spoke to Moses in the Sinai wilderness. Anyone who does not make themselves ownerless like the wilderness 
cannot acquire the wisdom and the Torah. Therefore, it says the Sinai wilderness. Thank you. There are three beautiful ideas that I take out of here. The first one is that the Torah is elemental. It's really a source of life. Here, specifically, this verse of Yeshua, Isaiah connects it to water. But again, think about those three things. There's fire, water, and wilderness, essentially earth. And then you could say, well, where's the air? Maybe that's the, the spirit, the neshama inside of us. But again, the idea is that the Torah is represented and connects to us on the most fundamental level. It represents all of the world around us. So that's the first idea. The second idea here is ultimately, obviously, people can charge you for water. They charge you a lot with water bottles. But really, you can just go outside your house and just walk to the walk. You're in wilderness. Just go. Just walk. You can find it anywhere. And fire. Obviously, you need something to start the fire. But anyone can start a fire. And, and I'll repeat that again. Anyone can start a fire. Please don't in an unsafe place. And for water, too. Well, obviously, there are places where it's harder to get. Ultimately, anybody really could find some way to get water. These are things that are accessible to everyone, regardless of age, gender, religion, any orientation. It doesn't matter. Everyone can access these things. So, too, everyone can access the Torah. That's a second beautiful idea. And if that was the message here alone for this class, I think that would be you know, worth the price of admission. But then he goes on, or the Midrash goes on one more beautiful idea, which is that the wilderness, again, similar, anyone can access it, is it's just this open place that nobody owns. So we're not talking about a settled city or an encampment or land that's been bought up. We're talking about just the wild where nobody owns it. I know today it's challenging to find something that no country owns, but really this is this no owner whatsoever. There's nobody holding on to it. There's nobody deciding what this land is for, what we're gonna build here. It just exists. And the last line of this Midrash suggests that if we are going to open ourselves up to learn Torah, to understand its wisdom, to be able to accept its laws, we also need to remove any kind of ownership or preconception. If we go to Torah and say, I'm going to go to the Torah, but I assume things about it. I assume that it wasn't written by God, or I assume that it's archaic, or I assume that, you know, if you make all these assumptions about it, it's like you already, you know, uh, you've already made your decisions about it. You're not open at all to learn anything new. But if you clear your mind completely and say, I'm not connecting myself to anything, I'm just totally 100% open to whatever the Torah is going to give me, just like the wild, 100% open, you know, wild lands that haven't been settled, then you can finally accept the Torah. So those are the three beautiful ideas in this Midrash. And you'll see that a lot of the rabbis kind of touch on it and different variations of it. Um, but because there's so much Torah in just that Midrash, I'll actually pause for a moment, see if anyone has any thoughts, comments, um, or responses just to this Midrash alone, which again, this Midrash is just incredible. Um, even without the other sources that we're bringing. Beautiful. So Leonard, this next source, we're jumping a little bit ahead in history. And what we're gonna do now is see that just as this Midrash already had two ways to understand it. One is the Torah is free for everyone. Two is you shouldn't uh, come with any preconceived notions, make yourself ownerless, just you know, cut any ties, you know, just don't come in with any ideas when you learn Torah. Um, there are other ways to understand the significance of this wilderness. So now in 19th century Poland, the, the Sfat uh, Emet um, has his understanding of what it means to be Hefker ownerless. So please, Leonard, source three. In the Midrash, the Torah is imagined as like the wilderness Midbar, in that one needs to be Hefker, free, unattached, ownerless, like the wilderness. The Midrash tells of a prince who entered one city after another, only to see the people flee before him until he came to a ruined city, Midbar, where he was greeted with praise. Said the prince, quote, this is the best of all the cities. Here I will uh, set my throne. The word Midbar comes from a root meaning to lead or rule. The Midbar is one who acquires acquiesces rather, to that rule. That is to say, a person should empty oneself, such that one 
has no strength or initiative save for the life force of the exalted one. Excellent, thank you. So this commentary of the Sfat Emet is actually, it's kind of similar to the last idea of Hefker. And by the way, that, that word that I keep throwing around there, Hefker, I think he translated it or this translation explained it well, free, unattached, ownerless. If you're walking down the street and you see, you know, a dollar bill and there's no one around and it, like no one really cares about losing, not that no one cares, but it's a dollar bill or a penny or something, that's considered health care, ownerless. Or I could just say, I, I have a book, I don't want it anymore, it's not mine. Anybody who wants it, come and take it. That's something which is health care. So it has like a legal thing in terms of, um, you know, objects. But here the significance for him is not that you're clearing your mind to accept the wisdom of the Torah, it's your clearing your 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 life from basically any sense of uh perhaps he's hinting at idolatry here is for me to accept god's authority i need to free myself from the shackles of any other authority meaning that if i live in a town and the prince is prince x and i accept him as my prince and then prince y comes in and says i'm the prince we're all going to say no, no no we already have a prince there's no room for you leave so what God did with the Hebrew people, according to this commentary, is he took them to a place where there's no Pharaoh, there's no other gods, there's no kings, there's no tribal leaders, there's nothing between them and God. They mavatel et atzmo, they nullify themselves. There's nothing here except for us and God. And then at some point they say, God, we're not even here. It's just you. And we can fully accept you, God, and your Torah. So again, that's that similar theme for one who wants to accept uh, God into their lives. They need to make space. And the more space you make, the more you're able to accept God's authority and the wisdom of the Torah. So a very similar but beautiful theme there. Any questions, thoughts, or comments on the Sfat Emet? Excellent. Jane, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. And we'll, we'll continue. And this, this next source here is from a 13th century compilation of Midrash. And again, you'll see some similar tropes, themes that were covered in that first Midrash. You can just tell that Midrash, just the rabbis just knocked it out of the park um, with that one of that, that so second source we looked at. Um, but here they talk about a beautiful idea that's very contemporary. And we really should emphasize this about Judaism in general and push to make it more like this image. So Jane, please, from the Yalkut Shimoni. Another idea, so that there would not be a dispute between the tribes in order that one shouldn't say the Torah was given on my land and the other should sh uh, the other say it was given in my land. Therefore, the Torah was given in a public ownerless location. The Torah is likened to these three things, desert, fire, and water, to tell you that like these things are free, so too the words of Torah are free to all that come. Thank you. Now, what's interesting is if you actually look at the history of a lot of religions, some of the most fundamental moments, the, the realizations, the prophecies of these founders of religion often happen in the middle of nowhere. They don't go inside of a castle that belongs to one specific people. They go out into a forest. They go out into a mountain to have this experience. Now, there's other reasons that people will have these ecstatic religious experiences in the middle of nature, but the, the basic idea is that anybody could have had it there. Anyone could come there. And in fact, here, when the Israelites went to Mount Sinai, Har Sinai, even though it was a unique, individual, intimate experience with God, anyone could have joined it. In fact, they did. There were Egyptians that decided to leave Egypt. There were other slave peoples that were not Israelites that came and joined our people and converted to our religion. But the whole idea is we are on neutral ground. This is not, even though God chose the Israelite people, God is presenting a gift to the world. And if somebody else wishes it, we're not going to bogart it. We're not going to be selfish about it. It's special. So we'll protect it. And we're going to be proud about it. But ultimately, we talk about the chosen people. We chose. We chose to accept God's covenant. Other people can choose that as well. So if the Torah had been given in the territory that was given to the tribe of Shimon, then people would say, well, that the religion really is just his religion and I'll go find my own. And there's another midrash with a very similar idea that this wasn't just, this one is more about the tribes. So no tribe could say, I, I'm better than you because the Torah was given on my land. His other midrash talks about the idea 
that every other religion, every other people, instead of them saying, oh, well, you got it in the land of Israel, so it's only the Israelite religion, or you got it in Babylon or Assyria, whatever, so it belongs to them. No, this was the in-between. Again, the no man's land, the no person's land, where everyone could have chosen to come there. And ultimately, people still can. And that's such an important message for Judaism today. Well, there is certainly this idea that, you know, we, we protect Judaism, we're proud of it, uh, and we want it to be our special intimate thing. If we treat it as something that it's only an insider religion, you know, you're not allowed to access the wisdom of Judaism Torah. you can't connect to the Jewish God unless you're already an insider, which unfortunately, plenty of people in Judaism, other religions act like that. If you're not already in, then we don't want you. That is absolutely the opposite message of God revealing the Torah, the Torah in the middle of the wilderness where anyone could come across it. Anyone should be able to access Judaism. And we really need to emphasize that message because if we don't make it equally accessible to all, then nobody's going to access it and people are going to lose it and it's going to disappear. Any thoughts, comments, or questions on that Midrash? Beautiful. So I'll take this final source here. And this is, we haven't seen Rabbi, um, Rabbi Sachs at Psalm, his memory be for a blessing in a while, but he had some beautiful thoughts on this week's parasha. Um, and in the full version of his Dvar Torah, he actually mentioned a lot of these midrashim, um, which is quite beautiful. His articles are comprehensive, but he also added some of his beautiful own thoughts. So I took a, a selection of his thoughts. So he goes on. There's another more spiritual reason about why the, the point before is why was the Torah given in the wilderness? The desert is a place of silence. There is nothing uh, visually to distract you. There's no ambient noise to muffle sounds. There's not the sound of honking horns and, and airplanes. To be sure, when the Israelites received the Torah, there was thunder and lightning and the sound of a shofar. The earth felt as if it were shaking at its foundations, but in a later age, when the prophet Elijah Eliyahu stood at the same mountain after his confrontation with the prophets of Baal, the idolaters, he encountered God, not in the whirlwind or the fire or the earthquake, but in the kol de mamadaka, the still small voice, literally the sound of a slender or thin silence. In the silence of the Midbar, the desert, you can hear the medaber, the speaker. Those words are very, very similar. And the medubar, that which is spoken. To hear the voice of God, you need a listening silence in the soul. The silence that counts in Judaism is thus a listening silence. And listening is the supreme religious art. Listening means making space for others to speak and be heard. This was one of the key elements in the Sinai covenant. When the Israelites, having already said twice, all that God says we will do, then said, all that God says we will do and we will hear, v'nishma, from the word shomea, to hear. It is the nishma, listening, hearing, heeding, responding, that is the key religious act. Is there enough listening in the Jewish world today? Do we, in marriage, really listen to our spouses? Do we, as parents, truly listen to our children? Do we, as leaders, hear the unspoken fears of those we seek to lead? Do we internalize the sense of hurt of the people who feel excluded from the community? Can we really claim to be listening to the voice of God if we fail to listen to the voices of our fellow humans? From time to time, we need to step back from the noise and hubbub of the social world and create in our hearts the stillness of the desert where, within the silence, we can hear the kol de mamadaka, the still small voice of God, telling us we are loved, we are heard, we are embraced by God's everlasting arms, we are not alone. This is such a beautiful message from Rabbi Sachs. And you can see after learning all the sources, it's, it's a very similar theme. The wilderness is a place where there's nothing to distract you, nothing between us and God. It actually forces you to pay attention to the world that is around you. Because in our world now, it's so easy to get distracted. And I actually want to end by connecting this to what's going on uh, in Israel today with the, with the violent attacks is that it's so hard to actually understand what's going on. That's one of the biggest challenges and questions I've been hearing people. What's even going on in Israel? Can you explain it to me? And my answer to them is two parts. One is, this is not something that came from nowhere. It's something that's been building up tensions for decades, for many, many years. 
But the second thing I say to them is, it's really hard to understand what's going on in this moment because no one's listening to each other. From the quite literal violent attacks and missiles being shot, you can't have any kind of conversation or dialogue when you are attacking and trying to kill each other, even if you're defending your own land. But the other thing is, if you look on Facebook, on Twitter, you listen to celebrities, you listen to the radio, it's really hard to figure out what the truth is because everybody's talking over each other. And I'm not saying that it's not okay to say things like, I support my country and I want this to end and I pray for it. There are statements that are appropriate and necessary to say, but if you really listen to the news, think about when they're presenting what's going on in any conflict, the pandemic, Israel, anything, are they just speaking to be heard or they're actually listening and trying to explain what's going on? And if you actually go into any piece of media, news or talk to someone and they're explaining something to you, really ask yourself, are they really trying to explain it to me or are they just listening to their own voices? Because if we actually pay attention to what's going on and we listen to the nuances, to the subtleties, we cut between the noise, then we can actually start to understand what's really going on in this world, to appreciate it, to read between the lines. And if people could do that with each other, instead of assuming what the other thinks, instead of yelling over them, if we actually listen to them, this world would be a very, very different place. So right now, if you ask yourselves, what do I do? Listen, listen, try and understand and listen.